Okay, so thank you for having me here, wherever here is. Um, I have slightly changed the title of my presentation. It's called now Screen Education and the Risk of Losing a Common World. So um, in the coming, let's say 20, 25 minutes, I will try to um, explain why we are currently running the risk of losing a common world in an era in which we are forced to switch to digital or distance education. And um, the upshot of my presentation is really future oriented in the sense that at least in my country, many people believe that even when we return to normal, uh, digital education is something that uh, needs to stay. And um, some of my colleagues, even at my own university, actually refuse to go back to face-to-face -to -face teaching. And um, the talk I'm going to give is really uh, given in by uh, the, the fear I have. Um, about certain risks that come with, uh, let's say, generalized uh, digital education. Okay. Um, let me start by saying that my background is really in, in education studies, but more particularly in educational philosophy. So more than a psychologist, although I work at the psychology department, I'm really more like a philosopher of education. And um, the work I'm going to present today really has to do with thinking about what exactly do we do when we educate, when we teach, when the new generation uh, learns. And I want to begin with, let's say, two clarifications. Um, so I want to define uh, what I understand under education. And I also want to um, develop a particular perspective on education, which I call Tigno-centric. So these are the two things I want to uh, clarify before I go deeper into my main arguments. So very often uh, education is defined in terms of um, effective and the effective and efficient realization of learning outcomes. So I would say that this is a very um, limited and reductive understanding of what education is all about. And this would mean that education is uh, only about imparting skills, knowledge, is, knowledge and values, and this can be done in more or less uh, effective ways. If we only define education in that sense, well, then the story is very simple, that maybe um, distance education, online teaching, online learning is much more effective than traditional, way, traditional ways of doing it. But I think that the matter is more complex and that something else is at stake. So I really want to take issue with, let's say, the dominant discourse in which the whole issue or the whole question of traditional versus online learning uh, should be decided upon merely by looking at uh, learning gains or learning losses. Yeah. So uh, some people welcome very much online teaching because um, there's a great... Uh, it will come with a great gain. Other people really fear distance education, uh, online teaching, because uh, we cannot realize what we uh, were used to realize before in terms of learning outcomes. My take on education is a different one. Uh, I will define together with Hannah Arndt, who is a great inspiration of uh, what I'm going to say here. Um, these are also ideas I have developed with my colleague Piotr Zamoyski in the uh, book you see on the, on the slides. So we have kind of ontological understanding of what education is, what education is all about. 
Um, so according to Arendt, uh, education is an intergenerational interaction during which the older generation, we, the existing generation, um, is somehow challenged by the fact that new life appears in our world, in an existing world. Newcomers um, are suddenly there and it's our choice as the older generation uh, what to do with these newcomers. So we are challenged to uh, take up or not the responsibility to pass over a world to them out of love for this world, but in such a way that the new generation is really addressed as a new generation so that they can start anew with uh, the world. So this is a completely different approach towards education, which is not first and foremost oriented uh, towards learning. So obviously, in, when we educate, uh, there's always teaching and learning involved. But the question is whether or not learning is solely about, let's say, kind of individual gain, uh, growth in knowledge or something like that, or if learning can be defined in terms of are we really passing on to the next generation something of value? Do we show to the next generation that something is valuable, that it is interesting, so that they can uh, go on with it and start uh, with it uh, in new ways? They can add new beginnings to the world, as uh, Arendt would say. So if you take uh, this definition of education as a valid one, uh, then we have to look at uh, education and the actors in education in completely new ways. So th this would first and foremost mean that the object of pedagogy is not so much pupils and students, learners, uh, people who learn, but or common world. Um, so th that's why uh, common world is in my the title of my talk today. Um, so this might sound a bit strange because mostly and uh, in many talks today, uh, the focus is really about it's really on the learner and his or her own individual uh, learning trajectory and making sure that uh, we realize learning outcomes and individual learners. Um, again, I'm not holding a case against this, but I think that something more fundamental is at stake, namely that in education, uh, um, what we're really concerned about is that there is something valuable in the world and we really want to care about it. And as the older generation is going to die someday, uh, we have to pass it on to the new generation, but at the same time, uh, we have to respect the newness of the new generation and make sure that they can start again with uh, the world. This also means that, uh, and this refers to the book I wrote with Piotr on teaching, uh, that we ha really have to redefine the figure of the teacher, namely in terms of a kind of, uh, what I call here, internal necessity. So rather than, again, than defining a teacher in terms of uh, competences and skills, so you are a teacher because you are an expert in the art of teaching, Arendt would say, uh, you could also define uh, a teacher in term of, terms of love for the world, taking up responsibility for the world, and more specifically in terms of love for a particular subject matter, mathematics, history, cooking, theater, you name it. Um, so the moment that decides on you being a teacher, so it's a very ontological and existential definition, is the moment one falls in love with an aspect of the world, then one really falls in love with something, one has no choice but to pass it on to, the, to others, to the new generation, making others attentive so that they can start sharing in this uh, love. So the central notion in trying to understand what education is all about is uh, care. We educate because we care about the world, because we care about a new generation. 
And um, what we do as educators is trying to make this new generation attentive for things that are worth looking after so that they can continue with it. Okay, so this is a brief introduction on what I understand uh, their education. Um, okay, no, excuse me. The second short uh, clarification is that I have a very strong technocentric conception of education. Um, so education, as I just defined it, cannot take place under every condition under no matter what condition or everywhere or always um, education is dependent upon particular technological conditions which i call uh, school conditions and even school technology and again this might sound very strange um, uh, talking about school technology Mostly we talk about technologies that we use at school, but I will define the school itself as a technology. But then again, we have to understand very precisely what the word like technology means. And here I'm inspired by the French philosopher of technology, Bernard Stigler, um, who has a very broad definition of technology. Um, technology refers to all objects, not only the ones that are driven by fuel or electricity, like uh, the technology we are using right now, but all the objects rely on to be able to think, speak, and act the way we humans do, um, as well as the concrete bodily practices and routines that we need in order to operate those objects or artifacts, maybe artifact is a better word. Um, so in that sense, the pencil we write with is as much technological as the keyboard or the touch screen we type on. And uh, writing with pen and paper is as much technological as, uh, again, typing on, uh, on a keyboard. So this is a very, very broad definition of technology. Um, Stigler goes, goes so far, excuse me, as to argue that uh, the becoming of human beings, anthropoge anthropogenesis, sorry, is actually technogenesis. So it is uh, the invention of particular technologies, so objects and the routines linked to them, that makes us in who we, uh, or makes us who we are. One of the things he discusses at length is, for instance, the invention of the uh, uh, writing system, different writing systems, and for instance, uh, the particular impact of alphabetic writing systems. And then again, the school is very important because of uh, the, the first task of the school is exactly to get uh, acquainted with this particular technology. Most things we do at school is actually based on this very, uh, um, it's a very basic introduction into basic uh, literacy. Two important remarks. Technology is not static, but has a history. Um, we have not always used uh, pen and paper to uh, write with. Um, if you would delve into history and not even uh, far gone history, uh, you would uh, be surprised to note, for instance, that um, learning to read and learning to write, which we usually see as things that are coupled, uh, and are actually from a very recent date. Yeah? So it, it, we only uh, massively started to learn how to write mid 19th century, because before that date, there was no possibility to uh, exercise longhand writing because there were no pencils and there was no, cheer, uh, no cheap cellulose paper. So it was just impossible to get the hang of it to develop the routine. Whereas learning to read is much older 
uh, for instance, is dependent on the existence of printed uh, editions of, for instance, prayer books, where you have the Pater Noster, the uh, famous prayer from uh, uh, in the Christian tradition. Young people knew the prayer by heart and they could look at the printed version and so they could discover the relation between psalms and uh, written signs and so they learned how to read. For instance, in uh, 16th century, after the invention of the printing press, that became quite easy. But they didn't yet learn how to write. This is only an evolution from uh, 19, or something that was invented in the 19th century. So if we <clears throat> take Stigler's hypothesis seriously, that the technologies we use define who we are, what we can think, and what we can say and what we can do. This means that dependent on diff different uh, technologies that we use, we are different human beings, dependent on the technologies that we learn to use uh, um, during our education, we become different uh, kind of human beings. Now I've given um, very um, concrete examples now of technologies like the things we used to write with, but I also claim that the school itself is a technology and I really, really seriously mean what I say. So I want to draw your attention to uh, the picture we have on the left hand side, which is um, architecture designed by a Belgian architect Wim Kuivers, the perfect school in which he tries to, he also conceives of the school in terms of technology and he's an uh, avid reader of Arendt and he has tried to uh, bring the school back to its essence, but I mean the school as a technology and this means the school and the classroom as a building. So what is a school fundamentally? Well, it's actually just four walls in between, in, uh, uh, so there are the four walls where the new generation and the old generation uh, gather, they come together. So it's thanks to the uh, four walls that they have a chance to meet, that they have a chance to put something on the table, which is a particular aspect of the world. Again, mathematics, history, dance, carpentry, cooking, whatever. It's very important that there are no windows. So. Um, attention cannot, uh, this attention is actually captured by the thing of study that is in the middle, so to speak. So there is no possibility of distraction. There is only a big uh, hole left in the, uh, in the ceiling. So there is uh, daylight. And of course, there's a door to enter the room and to uh, leave the room. But that's actually, in essence, what the school is you have everything there in order, technologically speaking, everything is in place there to, uh, to uh, perform school, so to speak, in terms of the meeting between the older and the new generation. Okay, um, so the school is a technology in this broad sense of the word. Um, it's important to add, and that's the last remark that um, technology, and the way that Stigler conceives of it is always uh, pharmacon. This is a Greek word. He derives from Derrida and also from Plato, uh, but we still use it today when we talk about pharmacy. Yeah? So uh, the drug store, you know, the drugs we use are always at the same time, simultaneously cure and poison. The drug can cure you, but if you take too much of it, uh, you might die. And when you move on to the, so the question of um, digital education and a kind of uh, screened education, um, to, to, to make my point clear, uh, I'm not, so maybe I have given the wrong impression at the beginning of my talk, but I'm not against digital technology per se, or not against digital educational education per se. So the question is, if all technologies are pharmacons or pharmaca, then digital education is also a pharmacon. So it can be used as a cure, it can be used as a poison. 
So and certainly, and, and during the parts of the conference I uh, attended, there have been given very good examples of um, how you can use digital technologies in very uh, uh, creative and interesting ways. And I can only advise this uh, book that you see here from my former colleagues from Edinburgh, uh, the Manifesto for Teaching Online, um, where they developed some very, very uh, thought through, well thought through initiatives for teaching online. Um, and a strong, a really strong part of this text of this manifesto is that um, they really try to involve the teacher to really think together uh, what good teaching online could consist of. And they give very good uh, examples. And it really demands you to think outside of the box. So what they warn for, and uh, it's really not just to use existing uh, technologies like the one we are using now, huh? Zoom, which is actually uh, a technology uh, developed by business people to have meetings. Uh, so it's a conference uh, technology, it's not a teaching technology. And that is, thing, I, I think, what's, which is really going wrong, especially in my country, is that um, there is a very strong tendency to reduce the figure of a teacher to someone who simply has to carry out plans that have been devised by experts and by policymakers. From one day to the other, we had to switch to Zoom education and uh, without really thinking about the uh, limitations of this medium, which actually comes down to a proletarianization of the teacher. So the teacher is just someone who has to carry through decisions that have been made by uh, others. Um, if we solely rely on Zoom and other conference conferencing technologies, I think we end up in a situation like the one you see here, which is a picture that is taken from a very famous book by Michel Foucault, um, Surveiller Punir, um, I've forgotten now the English uh, title, but it's a very well-known book that is used by many progressive educationalists um, to hold a plea against uh, the school. Um, also the school I have defended uh, thus far, namely that um, the school is a horrible institution which can be compared to prisons and hospitals and so on so forth because it um, immobilizes students they have to sit still the whole day they are not allowed to go to the toilet whenever they want so they are rendered passive and docile so they really uh, learn how to take a very docile passive attitude, which prepares them, of course, for a later life in which they will have to do uh, brainless uh, work in a society that is obsessed with productivity, not with uh, individual happiness. And um, in Foucault, you'll find this example of the uh, pr uh, prison of Rennes, uh, south of Paris, I believe, where the uh, uh, prisoners were allowed to have classes. But as you can see there, there, they are also in a kind of very strange auditorium where they are locked up in small boxes. And maybe you could say this is exactly what is happening today with uh, distance and uh, digital education. Um, when I look at my students online, I'll only see them in uh, small boxes in front of me. Um, you could say this is uh, what Foucault describes has actually been realized to the full. We expect students to be uh, immobilized the whole day, uh, sitting behind uh, the screen, appearing in boxes where uh, the uh, prison guard, i.e. the teacher, can immediately see who is the present and who is uh, not. So I would say that one of the dangers of uh, digital teaching is that we exactly uh, promote a very, very uh, passive attitude in our students. But I want to go further than that and 
try to make a deeper, perhaps more philosophical, educational point about why is it important to come physically uh, together? And what do we lose when we switch fully to online teaching, even in non-COVID times? So physically being together in school, why does it matter? Well, I think it matters because it allows for a few basic pedagogical operations to take place. So again, basic pedagogical operations in, 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 um, in, in view of Aaron's strong concept of what education is all about. So why is it important to meet uh, physically? And I mean, as a group of students, but also students and their teacher. Because in a face-to-face -face classroom, I think there's more opportunity to share one's love for the world with others, i.e. with a new generation. I mean, in a face-to-face -face classroom, it becomes immediately uh, visible whether or not a teacher cares about the world or about the aspect of the world he or she represents to the new generation. For instance, the care with which he or she handles uh, handbooks, for instance, or the care um, with which he or she reconstructs a theorem on the blackboard and uh, step for step uh, tries to show how uh, a particular thing in his or her discipline is actually constructed. But also, as you can see, I'm, uh, I'm myself a teacher who really uses uh, his own body in order to uh, try and show to the new generation what is uh, important. I think the, the movement of the teacher, the gesticulation, the um, whole uh, set of uh, um, bodily, emotional, uh, gestural dynamics that is present in the classroom, which uh, disappears on screen, which is nevertheless, in my view, important because education is really about passing on to the next generation that what you really believe is of uh, importance. The second basic pedagogical operation that is jeopardized is that education, as Aaron says, is really about showing that this is our world. I mean, our world, this was also in my uh, title. Um, the whole concept of world um, has to do with the fact that we are not the soul, in the, in the, that, that there's more to existence than only my individual uh, existence. So again, if you only think about education in terms of learning, and everything is about the development of uh, individual uh, growth, self-development, but maybe in education more is at stake, namely that there is a world that precedes us also as individual uh, creatures. Um, so there is something that is more important than our own small self that's why it is a common world third operation is becoming attentive uh, so it, i really believe it's the task of the educator to not only to show to the new generation that there are things that are important but also to make the new generation attentive but again attend and i'm referring to the work of yves Citon, uh, attention is not or should not first and foremost be considered as a psychological faculty, so something that an individual has or has not, uh, and some have it more than others. No, no, in this very beautiful book, Citon shows that attention is a social and even ecological uh, category, something that is not given, but that needs to be developed, and we have to develop it together and together meaning with other people, but also with other things and uh, technologies. So he gives an example of uh, a particular organization, it's the Order of the Third Bird, uh, who laments the fact that in the time of uh, smartphones, uh, attention has become a problem. So uh, you go to the museum and you decide with a group of people 
to, to, to go and uh, stare to a particular artwork in the museum for a whole hour. And you will see that uh, after a certain time, more and more people are also going to uh, be attentive for the same object in the museum. This is a nice illustration of how attention is not an individual capacity, but is the result of what we do together in relation to particular technologies. And so you could say that uh, so even very traditional face-to-face -face school forms like the lecture in the lecture hall can be a kind of attention technology because so this is something that you really lack at home when you sit behind the screen. You don't know what the others are doing. If you're in the lecture hall and you're distracted and all of a sudden everybody starts to write something down, you're immediately uh, attentive again because you know that something very important has been said. Just to give another example of how attention is uh, structured collectively and ecologically. Right? And last, thing, and then I'm going to come to a close, I believe, um, is as a basic pedagogical operation, uh, experience to belong to a new generation. So when we go to a particular place, the school, to have this face-to-face -face interaction, we are literally going to school. So we really, we have to leave the home world where it's safe and comfortable to go to another place. So I think it's really problematic if we always stay at home in order to learn, in order to be educated. Because we have to go to another place, which is not of our own choice, where we are exposed to people we have not chosen. Of course, they are peers, but they are not necessarily our friends, can, can become our friends, of course, but they are, to a certain extent, randomly, uh, randomly decided who's there, who's not there. We do not decide who our teachers uh, are. That's completely, uh, so we are also uh, forced into a situation which is probably not comfortable. And in that sense, it's different from the coziness of the home uh, sphere. And I think this is important for many uh, different reasons, because there we have a very strong, and I would say again, bodily experience that the school is not there for me, right? It's not for me, me as an individual. There is more at stake. Um, we are addressed not as, individual, uh, as individuals, but as people who happen to belong to a particular generation. Yeah? Um, in a sense, it doesn't matter who we as individuals uh, are. In that sense, education is for everyone or uh, for no one in special. And I think that there are particular things that can happen at uh, physical schools, for instance, laughing together, which is a very important thing that we burst out in laughter together, for instance, when something silly uh, happens which is completely, has become completely impossible uh, online. Um, I just use this example also, uh, if, if people ask what is the difference between real life uh, uh, things uh, and uh, online, well, laughing together is a very strong example that we all recognize. I mean, if you are sitting alone behind a screen and something funny happens and you laugh, it doesn't have the same quality as being in the same room together and uh, laughing out loud uh, together. Okay, um, the last thing um, I just want to, uh, to add um, is, uh, and here I refer to this beautiful book by Michel Serre, who recently passed away. Um, so the particular threat I see uh, with, uh, or that could come about due to distance education and generalized digital education is um, that we um, strengthen something that is going on now, which would be called the culture of, what I have to use a French term, maintenant. Now, not now. Um, so the point I want to make, I will be very quick, so we have, still have time for discussion, is uh, so if education is really about taking a particular stance toward the world, stance of love and care, and uh, trying uh, other people to develop the same stance, it's important to understand how uh, technologies that we use today uh, 
quite influence and even remediate this relation vis-a-vis -vis the world. And in this book, um, at least in my interpretation of it, the thesis that Sarah is trying to make is that if we really want to understand what digital means are doing with us, and he's a very positive about it, by the way. So if you really want to understand what you're doing with us, we have to look at the cell phone. So the cell phone is the most perfected form of what has always been at stake in the many technologies we have developed over the last uh, millennia in order to capture uh, reality on our screen. So you could make a kind of genealogical analysis where you have, I don't know, painting, photography, television, and then uh, digital technologies. And finally, we have the uh, cell phone. So uh, handheld uh, screen-based technology. And here the technology is, comes to perfection, so to speak, because what we experience on, the, on this screen is uh, the condition of what he calls man, the non, the condition of no. I have to say it in French because it's a kind of word play because maintenant can mean two things and it means the two things at the same time. So it is really maintenant. It's the now. The only thing that, thing that counts is what happens now, what we see happening on our screen now. So we live in a culture of total immediacy, but it's even stronger. What's happening is even stronger than that, namely, Maintenant also means literally what I hold in my hand. Maintenant, so to hold in your hand, to capture in your hand. So the world gets reduced to what I hold in my hand, which is actually very interesting. So when there are very interesting studies about that. When you look at the screen of the cell phone, you don't have the feeling that you look at something behind it, which you might have when you look at television, for instance, but um, the tactile and the visual sense actually coincide. It's a kind of tactile vision. Screen is not a window to, that transports me to another realm. Uh, the screen is, so to speak, a mirror, which is also true because if we shut it down, we see our own face uh, on the screen. So you could say that and the, this uh, shift to digital technologies comes with a complete redefinition of reality, of what counts as real, what counts as important, what belongs to the world, what in the world is interesting. It gets redefined through the screen we uh, use. And so to conclude, uh, the issue is then what an appropriate educational response can consist of. So are we still willing to have a society with schools, meaning with school technology, with school time and space, which would mean that we can uh, experience the world again as something that goes beyond the uh, mere immediacy of the man, the non. So the question would be how to disclose a common uh, world, a world that transcends also the level of the individual and to make it uh, present again. Mm -hmm.